Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Steven Spatz, Assistant Outreach Librarian. And on behalf of Library Director Joe Lucia and the staff of Falvey Memorial Library, I'd like to welcome you to the culminating event in this semester's Scholarship at Villanova Lecture Series. The Scholarship at Villanova Series is a library-sponsored forum for faculty authors and award recipients to showcase their latest academic research and publications. And this year, we brought you talks from Villanova scholars on diverse topics from disciplines across the curriculum from engineering to philosophy, and from English to business. Supporting the production of original research is central to the mission of Villanova University, and one of the ways in which the exceptional scholarly achievements of our community are recognized is through the annual presentation to one deserving faculty member of the Outstanding Faculty Research Award. Each spring semester, we're proud to host the current recipient of the award as they present their work here in the library in an annual special edition of the scholarship at Villanova series. This afternoon, we're pleased to have with us the 2008 Outstanding Faculty Research Award recipient, Dr. Robert Defina. Dr. Defina is currently a professor in the sociology department here at Villanova. He previously spent over a decade as a member of the economics faculty, including four years as the John A. Murphy Endowed Professor of Economics. He also served three years as director of the Villanova Center for Peace and Justice Education. Dr. Defina's latest work centers on poverty and social inequality, and today he'll be presenting to us the research outlined in his article, The Impact of Mass Incarceration on Poverty, which will be published this year in the journal Crime and Delinquency. Please join me in welcoming the 2008 Outstanding Faculty Research Award recipient, Dr. Robert Defina. Thank you for that very, very nice, uh, warm introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's a, really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have been very honored um, by this award, uh, and, I'm, and I'm thrilled to be invited to talk about my research, and I thank the library staff very much for arranging such a nice event. Uh, during my past decade or so, my research, <coughs> excuse me, my research is focused on poverty in the United States, uh, its measurement, its causes and consequences, and the effectiveness of anti-poverty programs. And the research I'm going to be talking about today is one strand of that research program. And I want to say at the outset that although I'm presenting it, that this was uh, a co-authored piece uh, done with my colleague in the sociology department, Lance Hannon, who's here, and he'll take the difficult questions, the ones I can't answer later. Um, and as you can see, it's um, the impact of, of mass incarceration on poverty. Like many um, research projects, this one originated with a puzzle. And to illustrate the puzzle that kind of got this project going, I'm going to show you a graph. I have all these devices. Okay. Here we have a graph that has, has two lines on it. Um, the purple line is my uh, heart rate. No, it's not. The, the purple line is the official poverty rate in the United States. And the, uh, poverty is measured in the United States using a series of income thresholds that are meant to gauge the minimum income necessary to live a minimally decent life. Uh, if your family's income is below that measure, below that threshold, then everyone in your family is considered poor. So what the Census Bureau does is it tries to gauge how many people are below that line, it simply adds them up, and then expresses that as a fraction of the population. That's what the poverty rate is, and you can see that how that moves over time. The second line that's kind of simply trending upward is real per capita GDP. GDP is the gross domestic product. It's the main measure of the overall amount of production and income in the United States. Real meaning it's adjusted for inflation, so it's in purchasing power terms. And so what we have is basically the average real income of people over time. And that's a standard measure that economists use to gauge living standards, what, what, what the real living standards are. And you can see that that's been trending upward over the past 40 to 50 years. Now, I want to focus on the relationship between those two variables. Initially, in the decade of the 60s, there was an inverse relationship. So you can see that as the real living standards of the average person is rising, the poverty rate is falling and falling dramatically. In fact, it was cut by more than half. And 
in a sense, that makes sense. Because if we're measuring poverty based on people's income, as average living standards are growing, to the extent that those a that average is representative of what's happening across the income distribution, people all over are getting more income, the economy is stronger, they're working more hours, there's more jobs available, hence people have more income and there's less poverty. At the same time as it happened, that was a period um, when the war on poverty was introduced. That is, there was a lot of new programs that were introduced that were meant to give income support to low-income families, as well as existing programs were expanded. So the combination of a healthy economy and the introduction of these uh, anti-poverty programs helped push the poverty rate way down. There's another little toy here. But then, here's the puzzle. Something odd happened in the 1970s, in the early 1970s. That is, although the real living standards in the country continued to grow, as you can see, the poverty rate stopped responding. In fact, not only did it stop falling, but it actually started to rise in line with the growth in the economy. Then, after a point, the, econ the real living standards continued to rise, but the poverty rate had stopped actually rising with it, but it just kind of moved sideways, up and down in a cyclical fashion. But it ended the period pretty much where it started it. So here's the puzzle. What caused the disconnect between the growth in the economy in average living standards and what was happening in the lower end of the income distribution? Another way to say this is, why was there growing income inequality so that the experience of the average person really wasn't representative of what was happening to people on the bottom? That is to say, the economy was growing, the gains weren't shared equally, they went mainly to folks at the top and not at the bottom. What caused the disconnect between the two? So that's kind of the starting point. And in fact, this has been studied for a long time and researchers have suggested a variety of possibilities. And I'm going to give you seven. I'll try to be quick about this, but I'm doing this to kind of set the stage to, to show you where we're coming from, Lance and I. First, people had suggested, well, it was globalization. And here the idea is that through the 1960s, there were good manufacturing jobs available and they allowed um, even people with low levels of education to earn a decent living. They could come in, work in a factory, get good wages, get good benefits. But the problem was, is that as we started to globalize, as we started to ship production abroad, deindustrialize, all those plants, those manufacturing plants closed down and those folks that had low levels of education who up until this point were earning a decent living now didn't have those jobs anymore. But the problem was is that the only alternatives open to them were low-level, low-wage service jobs. And so while the overall economy was growing as a re result of trade and globalization, the people at the bottom weren't sharing in the gains because they had to shift due to this change in economic structure from good-paying jobs to low-paying jobs. A second suggested reason is technological change. And here the idea is throughout the period say 1970 to the present, we've experienced dramatic technological changes, telecommunications, communi uh, computerization, uh, changes in transportation technology, a lot of things. But the idea was that the technology what was, called, was what was called skill biased. That is, it favored people who had high levels of, uh, of education and high levels of skill. And the people at the bottom, effectively due to the technological change, lost their jobs. So for example, we had computers, now we didn't need as many secretaries to do the typing. People were doing their own typing. Uh, now um, assembly lines were run by computers and there was robotics replacing people. Now, it wasn't that all these jobs went away. No, we still needed some people to run the technology, to develop the technology. But those were people with high levels of education. Once again, the people who were in the spots with low levels of skill they lost out because they weren't suited to take advantage of the kind of technology that came on online. A third reason that was suggested was deunionization. Uh, also during this period, there was a dramatic decline in the percent of the workforce that was a member of a union. In fact, it went from between 25 and 30 percent of the workforce down to less than 10. Right now it's about 8 percent. The reason this was important was that because other things equal, members of unions earn a higher wage compared to similar but non-unionized workers. In fact, 
the so-called union wage premium that people get is estimated to be on average about 20%. Now, not only that, there's an average of about 20%, that is your pay is 20% higher than it otherwise would be if you weren't in a union. But the union wage premium is bigger the less education you have. That is to say what unions do is they shrink income inequality. So people at the bottom of the education scale, if you're a union member, estimates show that your wage is increased by union membership by about 35%. Once again, what happened? Those union jobs went away. One reason was the deindustrialization, but there were other independent reasons as well, including increased managerial opposition, a variety of other things. The main point, though, was that as the economy was growing, deunionization was occurring, and a bunch of low-skilled, low-educated people who were benefiting from those higher union wages lost them and basically suffered a, a, an income loss of up to 35%. Once again, Poverty is persistent in the face of overall growth because of that change. A fourth reason that people suggested was declines in the real value of the minimum wage. Now what happened here is that when the government changes the minimum wage, it has to actually do it purposely each time. There's no automatic adjustment, not even for inflation. So over this period, the government occasionally did raise the minimum wage. But there were long periods of time, in fact, throughout the entire decade of the 80s, there was no change at all in the minimum wage. It was held constant in nominal terms. But what that meant was, because there was inflation, inflation was doing the dirty work and constantly eroding the real or purchasing power value of that. Now, even though we've recently had an increase in the minimum wage, the level still stands in inflation-adjusted terms way below what it was in the early 1970s. And again, what does this mean? Although the overall economy was growing, people at the lower end of the income distribution, the ones who were working for minimum wages, saw their wages fall and therefore didn't share in the gains. And it's not only that, there's what's called a, a ripple effect. Uh, labor economists estimate this ripple effect. And it, what it shows is that people, not only who get the minimum wage, are hurt by this, but people within about a dollar or a dollar and a half of the minimum wage are also affected. So when the minimum wage increases, all of those folks get a raise, not only the minimum wage, but the people above. But when it falls, not only the people at the minimum wage, but the people above their wages fall as well. So a number of people were hurt by that. Uh, a fifth thing was cuts in the social uh, safety net programs. We saw cuts in the cash values of unemployment insurance, welfare, supplemental security income. Again, both explicitly and because inflation was cutting in. And that's hurting people at the bottom. Again, at the same time, we saw growth. So you can see how this disconnect, at least possible, possibly why it was occurring for these reasons. Just two more quick ones. There was a change in family structure, and some analysts said that that had to do with it. In particular, there was an increase in the number of single parent families, female headed families, both due to increased divorce rates as well as increased rates of out of wedlock birth. These families are particularly vulnerable to poverty. And the idea was the increase in the fraction of the population that was in these vulnerable families caused an increased fraction to be subject to poverty even while and despite the overall economy was growing. And finally, one more thing I'll mention, and that's immigration. Some people have claimed that immigration of recent decades has contributed to this disconnect. Why? Because the large influx of folks that we've seen coming in tended to be low-skilled, basically Mexicans. And the idea is that we've had the labor market flooded with an increased supply of low way of low income, I'm sorry, low educated people, which would compete with the low educated natives, and that would push their wages down as well. So a variety of reasons have been suggested. But here's the thing. First off, only a couple of things have actually been borne out by the evidence. Um, globalization, deunionization, cuts in the real value of the minimum wage, cuts in the social safety net. Research has shown as these have had some effect in helping explain the rising income inequality. The other ones, technological change, change in family structure, and immigration, no. Little or no effect, although it seems intuitive that they might matter. Nonetheless, even though some of these seem to matter, there's still a lot of the variation and the disconnect that's left unexplained. It still remains a puzzle. And that's kind of where we entered. 
the fact that there was this puzzle and that people tried to solve it with all of these reasons, but no one's been able to quite crack the thing yet. Now, we looked at or decided to look at another dramatic trend that was happening during the period. And that was this idea of mass incarceration. Okay, what do we mean by mass incarceration? Well, I'm going to illustrate it with a simple graph. This graph shows the rate of incarceration, that is the number of incarcerated people per 100,000 of the population from the 1920s to the present. And notice something quite interesting here. For about the 50 years between the 1920s and the early to mid 1970s, the incarceration rate in the country, in the United States, was basically flat, with a little bit of wiggles there, but basically at around 100. Starting in early to mid 1970s, the incarceration rate rose and rose dramatically. In fact, it's currently close to five times what it was just about 25 or 30 years ago. Currently, there's 2.3 million people in the United States who are incarcerated. If we add to that the people who are on probation or on parole, there's currently 6.9 million people in the United States who are under some form of control on the part of the criminal justice system. An incredible rise, and notice it's happening exactly at the same time as the disconnect started to happen. And I'll get to why we thought that that might matter, but just let me make couple of other brief points about this. First off, although there's been this five-fold increase, it hasn't been evenly spread across the population. Rather, it's been concentrated on subgroups, certain subgroups in the population. In particular, it's been concentrated among young people, racial and ethnic minorities, and people with low levels of education. For example, Harvard sociologist Bruce Western has estimated that if you are a high school dropout, African-American male, by the time you're age 34, there's a 60% chance that you will have been in prison. 60% of that population will be in prison by the time they're 34. So this is a dramatic thing. Now, one other point I want to make is that it was disproportionately focused on young racial and ethnic minorities and low educated. but because in the United States, even in the year 2000, 2010, we have in the housing market profound racial and ethnic segregation, as well as profound income segregation, that is people live in separate communities by race and ethnicity and by income level were stratified, that not only was the incarceration focused on these subgroups of the population, but geographically they were concentrated because we take the groups that were affected and put them in their own communities. So that when we started to take lots and lots of people out and incarcerate them, what we were doing was we were devastating communities since all these folks were being pulled out of very, very restricted geographical areas. That point is going to come imp become important l later in the story as to how this incarceration is potentially affecting poverty. Okay? Okay. Now, a next question that I want to briefly consider is why did this happen? And then we'll talk about what the implications of it are for poverty. Why did this run up? Well, an intuitive explanation or a thought that might immediately come to mind as well, we saw this big run up in, in incarceration simply because there was more crime. That is, there must have been some crime boom that was going on there and we were basically grabbing these criminals, these increased amounts of criminals and putting away. Actually, it turns out to not be true. And, uh, or the way I should say is the evidence, there's no good evidence that supports that idea. Here's another graph. Here what I've put up is that same incarceration rate that we saw before, and you can see how it's starting in the early to mid 70s and then skyrocketing. This other graph that's kind of moving all over the place, that's the crime rate in the country. Total crime rate. These are what are called index crimes. These are major crimes that are tracked by the FBI. They include things like homicide, rape, burglary, robbery, car theft, assault, things like that. And you can see, well, throughout the period, again, 
the incarceration rate is just rising and rising pretty steadily, the crime rate is kind of all over the place. There's periods when it's rising and falling, rising, falling, rising, falling. And notice, over the whole period, while there was a lot of movement, the crime rate ended the period virtually exactly where we began, despite the fact that we had a five-fold increase in incarceration. So just on the surface, a simple graph like this, there's no apparent or very compelling relationship between incarceration and crime. Now, granted, got to be careful. This is only a two-variable graph. It doesn't prove anything. It's merely suggestive. However, there is a substantial literature that has looked at this more carefully, this relationship, using more advanced statistical techniques, controlling for a variety of other variables, in, in, including some work that my chair, Tom Arvinites, and I have published that looked at this. And if you look at that literature, even when you subject this relationship to a more intense, sophisticated statistical scrutiny, you still don't see any meaningful relationship coming out. Certainly no unequivocal relationship. So then what happened? Well, what caused the rise? What most people argue now, or at least a number of prominent scholars argue, is that that increase in incarceration has been driven by changes in the law and also changes in the enforcement of the law. That is, during that period, we kind of changed regime. We, we shifted to a harsher, be tough on crime stance. And it, and it happened in a number of ways. We started to institute mandatory sentencing, which required judges to give more lengthy sentences than they had before keeping people in prison for longer periods of time. We saw the advent of policies like three strikes, you're out, where you got sent away for good if you committed that third, that third felony. Um, we saw the war on drugs. And so what we were doing now is we were taking people who were relatively low-level criminals up until that point and dealt with e in, e in an easier fashion. We're now taking them and we're incarcerating them. So we're now incarcerating people who before we weren't. Um, there was also harsher treatment of parole violations. For example, in the period here, um, if you, say, applied for a job, and they asked you on the job application, have you ever committed a crime? And because you wanted that job, if you committed a crime, you lied and you said, no, I didn't. If you were found out, it wasn't simply a matter that you would lose your job. They would send you back to jail now. So there's a whole host of, of things that occurred in this kind of tough on crime regime which gave rise to that. Now, the last thing I'll address and then we'll move on is why did we move to that tough on crime stance during this period that ultimately led to this mass incarceration movement? Well, again, it's debatable, but what a number of prominent researchers have concluded was that it was really... Uh, aimed at social control of what were viewed as, perceived as, a potentially undesirable and threatening group. In particular, the gains from the civil rights movement in the 1960s gave racial and ethnic minorities more rights. In addition, all these structural changes we were talking about, globalization and so forth, were causing people in cities where the, where the manufacturing plants were to lose their jobs, to see lower wages, they be, we have now these large idle populations who were restless. There was rioting scene. And in light of all of this, something needed to be done to control this problematic population. One of the things that could be done was to simply incarcerate them. Now again, that's, it's debatable, but that's kind of a direction that people are going. Now, that's not necessarily the direction of our research, but it becomes important later when we talk about the implications of the research, exactly what is causing that rise. Okay. So we have this dramatic rise in incarceration, and we have this disconnect between poverty and the strength in the economy. Why might they be connected? Well, there's a number of reasons to think that this mass incarceration can lead to more poverty. There's a number of reasons to think that it can affect both the number of poor people as well as the depth of their poverty. That is, the extent to which their income falls below the poverty threshold for their family. And, it, and there's a number of reasons that relate both to the individuals who are incarcerated, 
their families and the communities in which they formerly lived and ultimately re-entered. First, the individuals. A variety of research shows that people who had been incarcerated, once they come back, simply because they're incarcerated, receive lower wages, have a harder time getting employed, and importantly, show lower wage growth in the future. So they're permanently hurt in terms of their earning capacity. And that means they're more vulnerable to poverty. And this, this occurs for a variety of reasons. Why do they get the lower wages and, and, and worse employment possibilities? When you go away, especially when you're young, you lose the opportunity to have any kind of training to develop social networks. All these things that help you get jobs and help you advance. Um, when you're in jail, the prison experience itself can be criminogenic. That is to say, it can actually make you a worse criminal than when you started, because you're learning from hardened criminals who are in there. Um, you can suffer psychological difficulties as a result of your imprisonment. And some interesting work by a sociologist named Deva Pager, who's at Northwestern University. I think she's still there now. She wrote a paper that explained how there's a stigma, which he calls the mark of a criminal record for people who were formerly in prison. That is, simply by virtue of being a prisoner, holding constant everything else, your experience, your level of education, simply by being termed an ex-convict, you will suffer a lower wage because people devalue you simply because you were a prisoner. So individuals who were imprisoned are more likely to be poor when they come out. Secondly. The folks who were going into prison, although they were criminals, although they committed crimes, they also tended, before they go in, surveys show, to have had some kind of job and earned some kind of income. What that means then is, obviously, is that when they're taken away, their family is going to suffer a loss of income, which will directly either bring them into poverty, since they tended to be low income, or if they were already in poverty, make their poverty worse, increase their depth of poverty. Moreover, because the person who was away, and more likely a man, say the, the husband, because he was a member not only of the family but of the community, he in a sense was part of the social network of the, of the family that connected it to the larger society. With him gone, social networks are diminished, their earning possibilities are diminished as well. And thirdly, because now the family has one less adult, it's going to be harder for the remaining adult to get a job because now they're going to be a single parent, which carries a whole lot of problems in trying to earn income as well. The third aspect of this is what happens to the community. OK, the community is actually, there's a couple of different ways that the community is affected. One might be a positive. That is to say, People have, have argued, well, look, you're, you're putting a criminal away. You're removing a disruptive element, and that's going to improve life in the community. It's going to make life better. And that could well be true. However, it's not an unambiguous good. Because remember, although this person committed a crime, and now they're, they're, quote, a criminal now, they were also, before they left, a husband, a father, a friend, a neighbor. That is, they too were part of an important social framework and the organization of the community, right? And so by taking them out now, especially in massive numbers, you're reducing the community's ability to organize itself. You're reducing its political power. You're reducing its ability to, uh, to collectively get things done and improve the life of the community. And from at least from a sociological point of view, kind of the life chances of any one individual in a community is greatly affected by their social context, by the community and the group they're a member of. The diminishment of the community's organization is also going to make it much more likely that any one individual is going to be in poverty or have a harder time getting out. And the one other obvious thing that removal, especially of mass amounts of people, is you're simply removing raw earnings power. Remember, these people were working. That means they were earning money and spending money in the community. And all that money that they were earning and spending had a multiplier effect. It was supporting the businesses in the community and providing jobs for people. You take that away, businesses can't survive as easily. And that means less employment for other people and more poverty. 
and supporting institutions, churches, uh, uh, libraries, other things that need those tax dollars and that money, that's gone as well. So for all of these reasons, that dramatic run up in the amount incarcerated, and especially the fact that it was concentrated in certain communities, <clears throat> for a variety of reasons, at least theoretically, opens the possibility that this had a profound effect on the amount of poverty. Okay. So what our objective is, what this as backdrop is, our objective is an empirical study that's going to try and quantify the extent to which that run-up, that big run-up we saw, that five-fold increase, has affected poverty in these communities. And what I want to talk about now is uh, kind of organize my, the, the next couple of minutes around three questions, three research issues that needed to be de dealt with. The first is <coughs> me, how to measure poverty. Since we're talking about what poverty, uh, the impact on poverty, we want to be clear about what poverty is. So we want to kind of look at that for a couple of seconds. Secondly, I want to explain some of the issues that are around how do you statistically measure poverty and model it so that we can extract the particular effect of incarceration among the other things that are affecting poverty, because there's lots of things that affect poverty beside that, potentially. And then finally, and this is very important, how can we be sure with this statistical model and analysis that we're establishing a causal relationship between incarceration and poverty and we're not simply identifying a correlation. That is, we're not simply identifying variables moving together, but we're actually saying, yes, it was the increase in incarceration that actually led to the poverty. Okay? So let me just address those in order briefly. First, measuring the degree of poverty. <clears throat> okay, as I mentioned before, you know, the official approach basically identifies the people who are poor using this, these income thresholds, and then counts them up and expresses them as a percent of the population. If that per percent goes up, we say poverty has increased. If it goes down, we say poverty has decreased. Now, this approach has been criticized for a number of reasons, but one reason in particular is that it takes a much too narrow view of what poverty is. In particular, it completely ignores the depth of people's poverty. And to see the importance of this, just do this kind of a quick mental exercise. Suppose between 2008 and 2009, the poverty rate stays the same. The measure of poverty, poverty rate stays the same. But also assume, although the poverty rate is staying the same, that everyone who's poor gets their income cut in half. Would we want to reasonably conclude between those two years that poverty has not changed? Well, I think a reasonable answer is no. We wouldn't want to do that. Yet, that's exactly what we would do if we only looked at the official measure. So what some people have argued, and, and a particularly influential person here has been the Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen, is that when we measure poverty, we should have poverty indexes that are more comprehensive and include other factors or characteristics that help describe the extent of poverty at a minimum we should include the depth of poverty along with the number of people who are poor. And so what we decided to do is we decided to take a broader view. We're going to look at two different measures of poverty when we look at the impact of incarceration. First, we're going to look at the official measure. Because although it has shortcomings, it still is the official measure and it still is the basis for a lot of the policy discussions and debates. So people would want to know, at a minimum, what this does to the official measure. However, we also want to recognize that incarceration can have a much broader effect on poverty, including the depth, and so we want to capture that too. So we're going to look at a second measure, this one developed by Amartya Sen, that includes both the poverty rate and the depth of poverty. And this is more than an academic exercise. Look at the next graph. What I've done here is <coughs> I've graphed both the official headcount rate over time, which is this green line. This is kind of a fraction, you know, a segment of the graph we saw way back when. And you can see what happens. It's certainly gone up and down. It has kind of a cyclical profile here. And 
what it's doing is basically it's following the business cycle. So when the economy was weak in the early 80s, the poverty rate rose. And then when the economy grew in the 80s, it fell. And then we had a recession toward the end of the 1980s into 1990, and it rose. Then during the, you know, the roaring 90s, it fell again. Then came the dot-com crash, and it rose, and so forth. But notice, during the period, over, as a whole, the rate ended the period slightly below where it started. Very slightly, but it's slightly below. So if we look at the poverty rate, the official rate, we would have concluded during this period that poverty fell. The purple line is the depth of poverty, the average what's called the poverty gap. The difference between people's poor people's income and their poverty threshold. And look what happened to that. It doesn't have that big cyclical, there's a little bit of cyclical movement, but generally what is it doing? It's trending upward. It ended the period 15% higher than where it started. So if I was to ask you now, over that period, did poverty rise or did it fall? What would you say? See the, see the issue. There, but there, the thing is, and it's not that one is more important than the other. They're both important. And so we want to capture both in our measure. And so the next graph, this is a graph of SENS measure, which I constructed. And you can see that it has elements of both. It's kind of a, it's kind of a complicated average of the two components of poverty, of the headcount rate and the gap. And so what you see is it has the cyclical fluctuations, like the headcount rate did, but it ends the period about 15% higher than where it started. So it combines both elements that we saw in the two series before that. So we're going to use both oops, this green line, we're going to model that and see what the impact of incarceration is on the official poverty rate. Oops, And we're going to look at the impact on that as well, All right? the more comprehensive measure. OK, now, how are we going to model poverty? Well, <clears throat> that is to say, how are we going to st statistically describe these series? What variables are we going to use? How are we going to model it? We're going to use what's called a panel design. And what that means is we're going to use data that vary both across time and across space, in particular, we're going to use what's called the state level panel. We have data, and I'll talk about the sources in a second, for each state, all 50 states, from the years 1978 to 2004. So we have the poverty rate, for example, in Alabama in 1978, poverty rate in Alabama in 1979, in Alaska for 1984, 85, and so forth, and so on. That is to say, in total, we have 50 states times 27 years or 1,350 observations. We're going to treat each state year as a separate observation. And we're going to model the poverty in each state year with a variety of variables for each state in each year. In total, we have you know, 1,350 observations, which is a tremendous amount of data to have. And so what this means is, in practical terms, when we estimate the model, we're going to be able to come up with very, very precise estimates of the roles of each of the variables we include. If there is an effect, it will show up. And if we don't see an effect, it's, it's probably not there because we have so much data. Okay? So this is important. And it's one of the benefits of using a state panel. You get so much data. The data that we use come from two main sources. One is the Census Bureau, and the other is the Bureau of Justice Statistics. The Census Bureau, we use the so-called March Consumer, I'm sorry, Current Population Survey. We use that because that's the data that's used to officially measure poverty. That's what the census data actually uses. So we're using the official poverty data. Also in there, we can construct a variety of control variables, which I'll talk about in a minute, which account for other possible influences on poverty, because we want to control for all those things and then look at the net effect of incarceration. So that's a big source of the data. The second is the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which is going to give us the data on incarceration rates. Okay? Now, how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to say that the poverty in a, in a given state, S, Alabama, in a particular year, 1978, 
is going to depend on a variety of variables. First, it's going to depend in the model on the incarceration rate. That's what we want to see. What is that link? Incarceration rate to poverty. But again, we need to control for a variety of other possible factors. And here, we collected about 15 or so other variables that in the literature theoretically could drive poverty. We want to control for those. They include two variables that capture the strength of a state's economy, because that's certainly going to affect how much income people can earn and their the poverty rate. We're going to use eight demographic characteristics to control for demographic characteristics that tend to be associated with poverty. Uh, the amount of female-headed households, uh, the amount of people with only high school degrees, uh, the amount of uh, uh, African, the percent African American, the percent living in cities, those kind of things that have been correlated. We're going to control for those. We're also going to control for three important low-income policies that affect poverty. One is welfare payments. One is the state levels of um, minimum wages. And the third is another income support payment, uh, program called the supplemental security income. And then finally, we're going to pick up two national effects that might be affecting state level poverty. So in total, again, we have about 15 different control variables. And what we'll argue is, because we have so many control variables, if we find a statistical link between incarceration and poverty, it's very unlikely that what we're doing is picking up a spurious relationship that it's really some other variable that's both correlated with incarceration and poverty that we've truly gotten this. Okay? Okay, the last methodological point has to do with what I mentioned before, establishing causality. Okay, again, you all know correlation does not mean causality. We want this effect of incarceration on poverty. <clears throat> if there was only a one-way effect, so that incarceration affects poverty but not the reverse, it's very easy to estimate a statistical model and get the, the causal effect. In fact, you can simply use an ordinary least squares regression, kind of the kind that you learn as an undergraduate. You need a couple of more bells and whistles, but basically that would do the trick. It would give you a good estimate of the causal link and would allow you to test statistically is that significant or not. But here's the problem. There's good reasons to believe that the relationship between poverty and incarceration is not a one-way relationship, but it's a two-way relationship. That is to say, it's not simply that incarceration might cause poverty. It could also be that poverty causes incarceration. Why? I'll give you just two reasons. One is, for example, there's a large literature that links poverty to crime. Higher poverty, the, you lay the seeds for crime, there's more crime. Well, more crime is associated with more incarceration. So a higher poverty is ultimately going to lead to more incarceration. So the link is not just going to go from incarceration to poverty, it's going to go the other way as well. Another reason is what I alluded to before, this idea of social control. To the extent that the poor, and especially the minority poor, are considered an undesired, threatening population, incarceration might be a means of social control to contain them. So, areas where there's higher poverty, we might simply see higher incarceration simply because of that. But notice again, it's poverty that's driving, driving incarceration, not the reverse. So what do we do? Well, if there's a two-way relationship, we can't use the simple regression, the ordinary least squares regression. If you do that, what you're going to get is your, your estimated relationship is going to be some messy combination of the effect of incarceration on poverty and the poverty on incarceration, and it's going to be unintelligible. You won't, we won't be able to interpret it in any meaningful way. Moreover, you won't be able to do any statistical testing. That's not going to be good. So what you need is a much more complicated approach to trying to strip out just the one-way one effect. Um, it's complicated, it's a multi-step procedure, and it's called an instrumental variables estimation. I'm not going to go into the details. Suffice it to say that it involves estimating a bunch of auxiliary relationships. The estimates have to pass a variety of additional statistical criteria before you can be assured that you got the right estimates. 
It's a very difficult thing to do, and it was a very hard part of our research trying to pull this off. It requires, in part, it requires skill. In part, it requires trial and error. In part, it requires luck. But thankfully, um, the planets aligned. All the planets aligned, and we were able to do it. So what we're going to argue is that we use this approach on our data. We have all this data, and what we will have been able to actually pull out and identify the causal effect of incarceration on poverty. These are our results. Regardless of the measure you look at, whether you look at the official poverty rate or you look at this broader index that includes both the rate, par the, the uh, poverty rate, the headcount rate, and the depth of poverty, incarceration has had a significant and substantial effect, that is practically, it's important, effect on poverty. In fact, incarceration has caused this run-up in incarceration, this five-fold increase. It's caused poverty to be about 20% higher than it otherwise would have been had we not had that increase in incarceration. And this is a causal, we are arguing this is a causal impact. We've stripped out with this technique whatever other reverse causality that might have been running around in that relationship. If we think back to the initial graph where the standard of living was rising and the poverty rate was basically flat, now the poverty rate would have fallen and it would have fallen by about two and a half percentage points. That is, we would have seen a graph without the incarceration run up, we would have seen a graph that showed the economy growing and poverty falling. And if you think about what that means, two and a half percentage points at the current poverty population, that's six to seven million people who are in poverty now that otherwise would not have been in poverty. Six to seven million people as a result of the individual effects, the family effects, the community effects. We got a similar sized effect using the broader index. That is, it was also about a 20% increase due to the run-up in incarceration. And what that means is this had not only a profound effect on the number of people who were poor during that period, but also on the depth of poverty as well. And they were roughly similar in terms of in proportionate terms. All right? So these are big effects. Statistically significant, but practically very, very substantial as well. Okay. What can we conclude? Well, certainly we can conclude that Mass incarceration has raised poverty. We would, we would strongly argue that, and we will strongly argue that, that it has. Uh, and secondly, that it's helped importantly explain this disconnect. Like I said, we would essentially see now a graph that you would have expected to see. Stronger economy, lower poverty. But thirdly, so those are some obvious things, but thirdly, I think our results also have important implications for a debate which has gone on for the last 20 years, at least 15 years, about, quote, whether prison pays or not. You know, it's really expensive to have this mass incarceration, to have this prison buildup. You have to build new prisons. You have to maintain the prisons. You have to maintain the prisoners. I mean, the, the standard rule of thumb is that just maintaining a prisoner in a prison costs $30,000 a year. And we have 2.3 million of them, right? Not to mention all the, the, the expenditure of prisons. The defenders of that run-up in incarceration argued that although it's expensive, the incarceration more than paid for itself because it decreased crime. That is, it had what was called a deterrent effect. That is, it scared people into being legitimate because now the, the chances of being incarcerated were so much higher. So people who otherwise would have committed crimes weren't going to commit them. So we deterred people. <coughs> but secondly, we also incapacitated people. And therefore, we prevented people who were habitual criminals, at least by the time they were locked up, they couldn't commit any more crimes because we had them locked up. And the value to society of decreasing crime from that run-up more than justified that that big expense for the prison for the prison buildup. Over time, as people again started to look at the relationship between crime and the incarceration trend, and they saw that it wasn't necessarily as tight as they otherwise thought, 
they started to pull back a bit. And now you start to hear things like, well, prison still has a deterrent effect, but maybe not as much as before, and so maybe it's not quite as clear as if prison pays now. And I mean, like again, our, my own research with Tom Arvin, I suggest that it, it didn't have any such effect, but even granting it had a little effect. If you couple that now, that softening in that stance, with thinking about the cost to society that incarceration causes in terms of this widespread and profound increase in poverty and all the problems that go along with it, well, there's no way anymore that one could really make a, a coherent argument or a cogent argument that prison pays. Thus, I think what our, one of the things that our research does is it helps move us more along in a direction that says, this has been a big mistake, we're wasting our money, there's a lot better uses of the money, and granted, we, there are some people that have to be incarcerated, but there's a lot of other people that we can deal with in much more productive ways to help re-enter society. Also, we can do a lot to eliminate the conditions that you know, lay the seeds and groundwork for, for crime in the first place. Better schools, uh, you know, better nutrition, and so on and so forth. The last point I want to make, and this is also, I think, kind of an important one for social policy, is that if you think about a couple of things I've said and, and kind of connect the dots, mass incarceration could well have started a vicious cycle. Because remember now, we've had this tremendous run up incarceration. Incarceration is now having a major effect on increasing poverty. But as I said before, increased poverty increases crime, which leads to more incarceration which leads to more poverty. So in effect, what we may have been doing now is not only doing things that are not sensible in a cost-benefit analysis, but actually making the very problem that we wanted to cure worse. So the bottom line is, um, I think we would argue that this has had a profound effect on poverty. And beyond that, um, I think it has some important implications for uh, for social policy with respect both to crime as well as as well as poverty. And uh, thank you for listening and I'm happy to take uh, any questions or comments. <laughs> Stunned silence. Bob? Yes? Has anybody estimated on the other side, I mean, we know we know the costs, but whether or not the people were incarcerated, whether or not that did give the, allow their communities to be to prosper in other kinds of ways, has anybody put a number on that side as well? No, no, not that I know of. I'm no answer to you. No, no. Who actually looked at kind of? No, I, th I think kind I, of the, the the Republican. A lot of this is driven by the war on drugs, from what I recall. Yeah. And so a lot of these people were in for selling drugs, the low-level criminals selling drugs and it took them off the streets, but whether or not it produced any of what they thought were the positive benefits of the community that had been, because it still drives that argument. Yeah, see, but th there's another side to that that's that's not talked about. You're exactly right. I mean, the war on, the war on drugs is certainly part of it, and as well as those other couple of things I mentioned, right. so you're right. What happens is when you remove people from these drug markets, right, they're quickly replaced. Absolutely. And the other thing is, and Todd Clear, who was here the other day, made this point. They're not only replaced, but they tend to be replaced by younger people who tend to be even more violent than the older people because they're less mature, they have less control, and so forth. Couple that with the availability of guns, and imprisonment in, for those kind of things can actually increase violent crime. It's quite interesting. Lance Hannon and I have another paper we're just about to submit to a journal. We're doing research. And we find that, in fact, this mass incarceration, controlling for lots of other things, it's possible that it actually has had a positive effect on violent crime. So on the one hand, you're taking away, but they're quickly replaced and with people who are even more violent. Yeah. So, But I mean, it's a very good, legitimate point you're making. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Were there any sort of cross-national uh, comparisons? I mean, where you see other countries uh, that have an increase in mass incarceration? Like this? No. 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 In fact, we are now, it used to be till a couple of years ago, we had the highest 
incarceration rate in any developed country other than Russia and South Africa. We've now, in the co past couple of years, we've even surpassed them. Now, no one's had this run up that we've had. No one. No one. In fact, it's kind of interesting. I'll just kind of throw this out as a sidelight. Bruce Western and, a, and an author, Catherine Beckett, uh, at, um, he's at, at Harvard, I mentioned him before, did a calculation. He argued that this has become, incarceration has become such a common life course event for young, certainly black people, young black men, that it's akin to being in a labor market. It's like, it's like, a, it's like a, almost like a labor market institution. And he said, in other countries, we, we look at them and we say, oh look, they have these big social safety nets. And this might be of interest to you. They have these big social safety nets, but the cost to the countries and those socials, of those social safety nets is higher on employment because the labor markets aren't as flexible. So what Western argued was, he said, well, wait a minute. They're simply, they have unemployment. We have unemployment too, except it's hidden. We're taking our unemployed people and we're incarcerating them and they're outside of, once you're incarcerated, you're not counted in the official unemployment statistics or the poverty statistics. What if we took all those people and included them back in the unemployment statistics. Well, it turns out that because we have so much higher incarceration rates than European economies, the unemployment rates are very, very close now. So the argument about the social safety net leading to less unemployment becomes much weaker if you take the view that, we've, that this is simply a way of handling unemployed people. That's debatable, granted, but it's an interesting perspective. But to get to your point, no, we, we haven't seen this on, in other places. We have not seen this. This is, a, this is American exceptionalism, exceptionalism. Yes? What effect do private prisons have on, on this? Because they obviously don't want to close down, right? Well, process. it's interesting, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've been following in the paper, the past couple of days they've had articles because of the <laughs> financial crisis and states are short of money. One way that states are, are dealing with this is they're starting to close prisons. They're saying you know, they're starting to rethink it, not for the reasons we're talking about, but just they don't simply have the cash. Yeah, private prisons. There was a, one of our colleagues, uh, uh, Bill Wagle, gave a talk just the other day on this on private prisons. And yeah, there's going to be a lot of fights. There's going to be fights not only for the private prisons, but also for people who are working in the public prisons because that's their job. So there are vested interests in keeping these places out open understandably. And that's going to politically cut, of course, the other way. But again, we're seeing the prison start to shut down or decrease in size, if for no other reason, because they just don't have the money to pay for them, at least at the state level anymore. Yes? Um, given the increase in the mass incarceration and also the recent attention on campus to like the death penalty and Sister Helen Perjan coming, would sure. you advocate that as a solution? To the advocate what? Death Heavens no. <laughs> Heavens no. No. I mean, I mean, you know, you're, ta you're talking to someone who's very much opposed to the death penalty, so no, I wouldn't advocate that. But, but I don't think that's that's not what's at issue here. I mean, uh, unless you want to simply say we're going to take these low-level drug dealers and execute them, because that's really that's where the growth. Most of the growth in recent years has been. These, these relatively low-level criminals who have now, we've used to deal with them in other ways, not incarcerate them. Now we're incarcerating them and we're sending them away for long periods of time. No, what I would, I would argue just the opposite. I, I would argue that we should have a much less reliance on the formal, formal criminal justice system, rather work to reintegrate people, deal with the underlying problems and reintegrate them because remember, every person you put away is potentially if just from a purely selfish point of view, is a, quote, a productive resource. These are individuals who can contribute to our economy, not to mention to the life of the community. And so these are, not, not to mention their own human dignity, I mean, I'm not kind of going there, but so the, these are people to be valued. So I, I would move completely in the opposite direction. I wouldn't even, no, I would abolish the death penalty. But that's just my, that has nothing to do with my research, that's just my personal view. Yes? Yeah. Bob, can you add to the argument you've given so far to make an argument empirically based to restrict gun use, gun sales, and to decriminalize drugs. It seems to me you're well on the way to those effects. I can't, no, I can't, not with my research, I can't. 
not with my research. I mean, uh, you'd have to. There would have to be all kinds of other links. You know, to what extent is gun control uh, is is or the lack of gun control associated with crime, so on and so forth. Uh, my research or our research doesn't speak to that really. Doesn't speak to it. Yes. Yeah, um, I see like all the economic um, good effects that uh, less incarceration get, but um, like um, like say child predators, like um, if you don't like, like I support like, three strikes law and the Jessica's law and that, but um, sure. where it keeps them in jail. I mean, it's like it can damage kids for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Now I want to be clear. I'm not arguing for no incarceration. No, there are people who do bad things and need to be in jail. The argument here has to do with the fact that the rise wasn't linked to, tr to trends in crime, that it was a shift in policy to treat people more harshly. So if you have somebody who's dangerous, they need to be incarcerated. So this, this is an argument about a political decision to, to drive up the incarceration rate for reasons unrelated to crime or directly unrelated to crime. So this is not an argument against any the need for any incarceration. This is not like the, the abolish the prisons society here. Although, I think there is an argument that comes out of this that we overuse prisons to a large extent. Well, I was just thinking related to that overuse uh, of prisons, like, that it disproportionately falls to less serious cases. The uh, greatest increase, the, the fastest growing demographic group in prison is uh, younger but still middle-aged women. So um, you know, it, it's not the, the, the stereotypical yeah. male child sex offender that is really being represented in this massive increase. Um, it's middle-aged women, it's low-level uh, dealers, uh, it's property crime offenders, non-violent offenders. Yeah. And, and one, of the, one of the things is, uh, that, that's come out of this is this idea of called, it's called vengeful equity, where you impose mandatory sentences. That was part of the get tough on crime. You impose mandatory sentences. Well, who gets nailed with those? It's the women because who, who are committing lower level crimes. Because if somebody committed a serious crime, they were getting a long sentence anyway. But now what you're doing is, whereas before, if it was a woman who committed a low level crime, a judge had some leeway, and they said, okay, no, we will, we'll give you probation, or we'll give you a short sentence. Now they're forced to give them a longer sentence and put them away, and it's resulted in exactly what Lance has said, an increasing proportion of women who are being put in jail, simply because of this odd policy. They're the ones who are disproportionately affected. Yes? And then to add to that, in terms mm -hmm. of societal cost, it's usually the women who have the children. So now you've removed the main caretaker from the family, and these children are going to suffer from that and therefore create more cost to society. Well, in, in, the, in the future, yeah. Right. Well, Todd Clear talked a bit about this the other day. Uh, to give him a lot of credit, he gave a great presentation. One million, right, one million kids now, right now, one million kids have a parent in prison. So, the, and, and he talked about the problems that, that, that are associated with kids when they, their uh, parent goes away. And it's interesting, one of the things that also happens is the bond apparently between the parent who remains and the child diminishes when the other parent leaves. It creates all kinds of tension and stress in the family, they have to focus, they have to travel to the prison, on and on and on. So you're very right. And that, again, that sets the seeds for this kind of vicious cycle in the future. You're going to... Marcus. Quite, I, mean, I thought your model, it, it just looks at levels of incarceration and the impact on levels of poverty. Yes. I mean, there is some variation in the type of incarceration across states. And I mean, is there a way of sort of teasing out whether certain types of incarceration, like longer mandatory sentences, tend to produce higher poverty levels in states that have it than in others that don't? We actually had talked about this. Um, and we, we don't have the data for that. Yeah, we don't have the data for that. One thing, though, what we're doing now, we're looking at the separate effects of entering versus being released. Because there's this issue of what happens when somebody simply goes into prison. Do they become more criminogenic? And we've, 
have, we have a paper based on a technique developed by a couple of other researchers that helps isolate the criminogenic effect. That is, you go in, you've committed some crime, and you come out, and now you're committing more crimes and worse crimes. And we have evidence, I think very strong evidence, and, and it goes along with the evidence of this, these other, the other literature that we're kind of trying to contribute to, that in fact it's having a criminogenic effect. But you're right, I mean, it would be great to, to look at sentence length and we don't have that data, although we, we actually were thinking of that same idea and talked about that. But it's a good idea. <laughs>